So hi everyone. Um, as many of you know, as many, many of you know, my name is Shane Flores, and I am the community facilitator for the Menitos Community Memory Project. Um, and welcome to Building Community Archives Session Two: Community Archives in a Global Context. Um, this is our floating monthly symposium that is a collaboration between the Menitos Project and the New Mexico Humanities Council. Um, it is great to see so many return visitors here from our first session. To me, that speaks of good things regarding our intention for this to be a space of ongoing dialogue and sort of mutual inquiry into this process of creating uh, community archives. Um, and then for everyone that's here for the first time, um, welcome to the conversation. Um, and it is in, in the interest of this conversation that I'd like to immediately basically turn things over to our special guest this month, John Boss of Shift Design, to introduce himself and get things rolling. So take it away, John. All right, thanks Shane. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm joining you from uh, Bobancha, as it's known to the indigenous communities here, the place of five tongues, a place of uh, meeting after many, many, many hundreds of years uh, in the bayous near New Orleans, Louisiana, as it's known by many others. Um, and here we are under a tornado watch at the moment. So I'm kind of, if you see me keeping an eye out on my window, that's because I'm wondering what is going on outside. I'm hoping that uh, the internet connection stays stable. Um, but I'm also hoping to have a bit of a conversation with you. I'm not really looking at this so much as um, a webinar or a talk as much as a conversation and to hear um, from some of you about things and how community-based archives, community archives fit within the global context. So I wanna kick around and share some, some ideas um, with different projects that we're working on right now um, at Shift Collective and where I think there are some really great intersections here. So that's kind of my, my aims and objectives. And um, I mean, you've seen the description of, of what, we're, what we're looking to talk about. I can't guarantee that I'll stay completely on focus with that. But um, just to tell you a little bit about myself real quick, I work with an organization called Shift Collective. Um, in the past year, we've really been reinventing how we do work um, together, kind of challenging the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, we really work as sort of a nonprofit design um, consortium uh, with three, two of my colleagues, Lynette Johnson and Burgess Jules. Um, and we work largely around cultural memory and um, bringing equity to the narrative and to the resources that are brought to bear in, in, that, uh, in that area or in that sector. Um, I come from a background, uh, you know, my professional background is from activism and finance and technology. And in the last 10 years, I've been really focused in, on, the, on the cultural space. Um, I run a project called History Pin, which you may have heard of. Um, that's been around for 10 years. And um, I also worked quite a bit uh, on something called Linked Open Data in Libraries, Archives, and Museums, which was around kind of the technology and the policy and the legal frameworks for how um, organizations, particularly larger um, cultural memory institutions can share their content in ways that other people can build um, and discover around that. And that becomes a little bit relevant as we talk about some of these other projects. Um, so that's a bit about me. I'd, I'd really like to welcome, you know, we've, we've probably got too many people to go around in a circle, but I'd love to hear, you know, if you could use the chat just to let me know um, what kind of organization you're with or, you know, how you're representing from that angle and and also if there's something in particular that you're interested in hearing about today I want to make sure that we cover things so please just use the chat and I'll keep an eye on that um, if you if you don't mind um, drop me a note and I'll kind of come back to that in a moment in, in the meantime I want to sort of basically what I'm hoping to do is open the hood on a couple of projects that we're working on right now um, that are one is national and another is international in scope, and particularly how it relates to um, community-based archives. So one is called the National Finding Aid Network. Uh, it's something 
that's been, it's an IMLS funded grant, Institute for Museum and Library Services grant um, that's looking at, well, it's housed at the California Digital Library, which is part of the UC University of California system. And, but it has a national scope where they're working with aggregators um, around the country who basically are, are helping people discover collections. Uh, a lot of it is in academic archives. We're really working with um, trying to get it outside of just the academic sector. So what does it look like for community organizations to be able to share their collections? Um, so that's one of the projects that we'll be digging into a little bit. And I probably be doing some screen sharing, a lot of resources here on the web that we'll talk about. The other project is around um, anti-racist or pro-localized metadata description, which um, sounds kind of boring and nerdy perhaps, depends, we'll see kind of in the chats how many of you are, are coming from the library archives world. Um, it actually is extremely complicated. I've been digging very deep into it over the last um, two months or so as we get ready for a convening that hasn't been made public yet. Um, but the, the gist of this is, is what does it look like to have um, the ability to describe collections, to describe content using the words that we wanna use. As we know, words are everything. Words are important, how we display things. It leads to action. It leads to how we build the world that we live in. And so if we don't have access or the ability to use words that we wanna describe things in, it really causes uh, an enormous amount of problems at the, at the work, you know, at, at one end of it, and it causes pain and structural racism on another. So that's one of the things that we're looking at is how these library systems uh, can begin to adapt to that. What's going on? Um, so I will also ask uh, Shane, maybe if you can help to folks mute if you're not uh, talking and then unmute when you're ready to talk. That always helps. I donate it to anybody who wants to commit to maintaining it and just having to figure that out. Do you have it on? Do you have your? All right. Um, oh. In the meantime, as that happens, as folks mute themselves, I'm looking at who's here. Thomas Richardson from. Sorry, John, I accidentally muted you. So can you unmute yourself, please? <laughs> yep, I love this. My, you know, the shirt that I haven't yet bought, but I want to is from the COVID times. It just said, it's like a microphone icon and it says you're muted because the amount of time that we spend <laughs> unmuting and unmuting. And then I started talking to my family about it. My 15 year old son, his shirt, he wants us to say, you're not muted. <laughs> like you need to mute yourself. <laughs> And then the grandparents, they, they wanted to have a shirt that said, where's the mute button? Anyway, um, a little side project. So we've heard from a couple of people. Katie, uh, uh, you're with Little Globe. Oh yeah, you guys, you did the thing last month, right? I think you're interested in, in developing a community archive. Awesome, Blake, Pueblo City Council, County Library District. And you run a space for community digits. Oh, nice, all right and you're interested in the platforms, you're looking at host images and other materials, okay? You get a little, you can look at some of the tech stuff there. Um, and we got information management preservation master student in Glasgow. Oh, from Scotland, hello Scotland. It's nice to have you here. Um, and you're writing your thesis surrounding community archives. We got good stuff here and Aaron, uh, Pueblo City. All right, great. It's great to hear from where you're coming from. That really helps me to understand um, kind of who's at the table and, and what we're talking about. So um, all right, I wanna say, just explore a few more concepts before I actually start asking you some questions because I have a secret agenda, which is to learn more about um, the problems and questions that you're facing because I really do think that um, the challenges of community-based archives or community archive. We say, I tend to say community-based archives. So forgive me if, that, if I go back and forth a little bit between community-based archives and community archives. We just use that, uh, something that Burgess Jules, my colleague sort of coined really within the funding community to try and make sure that we were getting 
to funding projects that were in the community. So not community archives that have been extracted from the community. That tends to be a way that a lot of these projects work. Like a university might partner with a community, they end up extracting those, that, that content or, or those collections, and then they become inaccessible to the community, even though they may be getting million dollar grants to work on it. Um, so that, that's why I tend to use community-based archives, but it means that you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the same thing. Um, but the other thing that I just wanted to recognize, and Ellen, I think, helped come up with this language. She mentioned a couple big words like decolonization, restorative justice, and intersectionality. And I'm not going to get real deep into those concepts. Um, to me, I think um, really what's interesting to me is, and, and I talk a lot of, about it as just kind of the return on investment or the ROI, particularly within the philanthropy sector right now and where people are funding. And when they're trying to actually all of a sudden throw all this money towards decolonization or towards diverse collections or diversity and inclusion, whatever you want to call it, to me, the ROI on actually trying to get major institutions to change when they've been built to do a certain thing is a total waste of money. Well, okay, let me back, let me back up from that a little bit already. Not a total waste of money. It's work worth doing. Um, but if you want to get more bang for your buck, you're going to invest directly in these organizations, which a lot of you represent. And so we do spend a lot of time um, making that case to funders, um, trying to figure out how they can lower their barriers so that they're funding directly. Because ultimately, if you want to invest in um, increased access and in increased preservation to these kinds of collections, you're going to fund directly to the organizations themselves. So that's, that's kind of one side of it from how we fund and support this. I think a lot of these different organizations are finding ways to do that um, and have historically found ways to do that. From the other side of it is how much of these um, global initiatives are actually starting to open up to a point where we can actually include these types of collections in the conversation. In order to do that, we have to get them to kind of speak a little bit differently. We need to get them to be present a little bit differently. And that's a lot of what our work revolves around. Um, so I'm just gonna stop there to see if there's any questions. I know I'm, I'm just I'm conscious of talking into, um, you know, and, and not saying much that's gonna be useful. And I'm, I'm seeing a few more notes here too um, from where people are coming from, which is helpful. Um, but before we get into sort of finding aids and what that is and some of the questions I have for you around it, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts before we dig into it? And I guess if people, Shane, if people are able to unmute or not, or, or if you wanna raise your hand or whatever, let me know. Somehow wave your hand. If you got your video on, I'll see you. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves. I okay. uh, um, I just muted everyone at the start. Um, but, um, they might have to ask, so if they need to ask, I will be ready. Wand at the ready to unmute everybody if they can't do it themselves. Okay. All right. No questions yet? Okay. I'll keep talking until I start to ask you questions, which is coming up soon, actually. Um, I think I may share my screen for just a quick second here. Um, and uh, before I forget, I'm going to make sure everybody has my email address. If you have any questions to um, afterwards or whatever, hit me here. And I'm <clears throat> trying to do my best to share some of these links too. So here we go. And I'm just, oh, Shane, um, can you can you make me co-host or something, Shane? And then that way I could, should just be able to share my screen. Uh, I forgot how to make you co-host. Where do I do just, that? Do just, um, just hover over. Uh, oh, hover your name, that's right. Picture, okay. Yeah. I remember now, let's see. You know, one of the things I do on the side is I, I teach um, Zen, um, Zen like um, communities around the world to, to take their practices onto Zoom. So I spend a lot of time <laughs> doing these kinds of things. Okay. And I just learned how to do live transcription on Zoom, by the way. Has anyone oh, done that? 
That is oh, awesome. Well, before it was that you had to hire somebody to do it. And so hopefully if it's that now you don't have to, that's really awesome. That's like a game changer. It totally it's is. And, and if you're trying to take notes for meetings and things like that, it actually like it's word for word. It doesn't do well. I mean, it's English only for the most part. So when you start using other language, you know, if you're speaking other languages or using words that reference other languages, it gets a little bit messy, but still it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great step up. Okay, that was a sidebar. All right, this is the first thing I'm gonna share with you. Oh, I just shared my whole screen. Okay, here it is. All right, so first, this is Shift Collective, by the way, shiftcollective.us. You can learn more about what we do and some of our projects, um, including the Manitos project was one that we worked on in the early days, um, helping get folks um, together and get some kind of national attention so that the funding would open up and um, really kind of learning from all that there was, all the rich uh, history and um, everything that was there. That project is near and dear to my heart and I love seeing it continue to grow. This is the project I want to tell you about, the National Finding Aid Network. And if you just search National, national Finding Aid Network and um, CDL, uh, it'll come up in a search. Um, but basically the idea here is how can we make um, content and collections more discoverable? And, you know, again, I mentioned that where the, where the default is, is that collections are kind of getting oftentimes vacuumed up or they're already at institutions. What we're looking at from a shift collective perspective and from a community engagement perspective is how can we make the things that we have in community-based archives, community archives, more accessible to uh, researchers or broader community um, to, you know, it could be just about anyone. And really one of the questions that we have around this is why do people, why do institutions share their collections? What are the motivations for it? And also how do you communicate the norms and the ethics for access to your collections. So if you think about a typical library, everything's open to everyone, but obviously there are some things that you may not wanna make available to everyone, particularly within indigenous communities. There are things that can only be seen at certain times of the year or can only be accessed at certain times of the year, can only be accessed by one part of the community to the other. And there are a lot of software solutions that have begun to address that. Um, and so, you know, again, this one is really looking at it from a finding aid perspective. Um, but I'm going to come back in a minute and I want to ask you about some of the challenges that you face there or what you're looking for. What are the goals and um, values and principles that you use in doing that? So that's one of them. Uh, the other project, as we talked about, was this idea of um, metadata description. And I've got this, I got to figure out how to make this into a better list, but um, this is some of the stuff that I've been reading to prepare for this as we start to look at gathering people around this conversation. Um, and I want to see if I've got something that's an example here. So yeah, this is a good example. So when we talk about libraries, archives, and museums, um, they've obviously been organized for a particular kind of um, knowledge organization and knowledge system. And no, no surprise, right? That's rooted in Western European per white perspective, male perspective, privileged perspective, back from when libraries were um, a massively privileged access. Of course, there are other ways of uh, organizing and representing knowledge based on different communities. And so this is an example from the University of British Columbia about an ind indigenous knowledge organization, different ways that people are using it, different classification systems, and all the way down to different ways of arranging the books on the shelves of the way you might find them, alternatives to the Dewey Decimal System. And so this is really what we're st starting to examine and look at the potential of how we can start to do things differently. The question is, well, there are a lot of questions. The questions that interest me and maybe that we can talk about a little bit more today are one, 
what does it look like to take this to scale? So if one community describes things one way, another community describes them another way, how can we start to find the commonalities? And technology is at a point, particularly when we talk about linked open data, where we can start to map across things. You can call things one thing versus the other, and you can still find that in the same way. And so that's something that we're really looking at, systems that work for one community that can then start to scale across others. And you see a lot of this work um, in indigenous communities in New Zealand, in Australia, and in Canada, not least of which because there's government uh, incentives to start changing these systems, right? We don't quite have that yet in the United States, but in Canada, there's been truth and reconciliation committees that have happened um, as recently as 2016 that have actually leaned particularly on libraries to start to change these systems and to find different ways. And the reason why, I'll come back from, well, I'll come back, I'll come back to this maybe. I mean, the reason why you start to change these things, and, and one of the, when I started to learn about metadata description and kind of the power of it, was thinking about the Library of Congress subject headings. So whenever you're describing a piece of content in an archive, you'll find that you have, um, at some point, depending on what software system you're using, you might have to use the Library of Congress subject headings, and you'll have to pick a Library of Congress subject headings. And the greatest example was a couple of years ago, um, people started to say, well, we do not want to call uh, undocumented immigrants illegal aliens, but that's the Library of Congress subject heading is called illegal aliens. In order to change that, right, like this is just a really simple example. In order to change that, you have to have an act of Congress to make that change. Like imagine how crazy that is. And so they actually did. They said, okay, we're gonna vote to make this change. And well, as you can imagine, it didn't pass. And so you had this, you know, all of a sudden an inability to start to change how we describe things. And as we see time and time again, as I said at the beginning, words mean everything. How we describe things, it's how our worldview is created. So having different ways to describe things is gonna be absolutely critical. So what we start to see um, and this, there's a, an, another great example, and, and this is kind of, I can maybe share a list of links um, if this is something that's interested to pe interesting to people. Um, I read a great, um, pro or I saw a great talk uh, from the University of British Columbia where they actually started to say, okay, with the tribes that are in our area, we're gonna take the, this was the National Library of Canada subject headings. We're gonna take the subject headings that we use and we're gonna run through them and say, what would you change? How would you change this? And it turns out that they changed 1,200 entries in the, in the subject headings. Like they just didn't fit to how they would describe things. So it was things like, you know, where spiritual practices, Native American spiritual practices were in something they would call scientific practices, or they were lumped into, you know, groups of people that they wouldn't associate themselves with, right? So they changed so many of these things. And then they started to create an alternative system. Now, what does that start to look like from a national level? And, and to me, the great hope here is how we start to have alternatives, how we have to start to find different ways of describing this and making sure that the machines respond to what we want, not we respond to what the machines want. So that's the, really the big question around this and something that I hope to see more and more people beginning to gather on and find um, different ways of exploring this. So those are the two kind of big projects that we're working on that I think put community archives into a global context. And a lot of the stuff that we've talked about with the Manitos team um, on the work that you're already doing, and hey, Mimi, I see you there. Um, and it, there's probably some Ellen's involved in that. I'm sure there are other people. Oh, well, most of you are involved in some capacity to this, right? Um, one of the things that I keep coming back to is that the challenges that are faced in what seem to be relatively like kind of straight out of the block questions are actually the problems of the system itself. Like when we can't figure out how to describe things or we can't figure out like, why is it so complicated to have to choose what uh, taxonomy we wanna use or what descriptions we wanna use? The reason is it hasn't been built for your use. It hasn't been designed for your use, for this level of use. And what we're trying to do is turn that around. So. That's kind of my spiel on these two projects. But I, I really want to kind of turn this around to you all and ask two questions. And maybe we'll, I'll start with one first. 
And this is regarding the finding aids question, right? So when we talk about the finding aids, I'm curious to know what, and you know, for those of you who are either, if you're starting community archives or if you're, you know, if you're actively a part of one or if you're, you know, in a library system, what, what is it that you wanna share with the community? How do you decide what to share with the community versus what you wanna have within like, and I guess the community is another tough question, right? Like, what do you, and how you define that, right? But like, what do you wanna use for your own community, the people closest to you that you're preserving for versus the outside world, researchers, et cetera. So how do you decide what you wanna share, what you don't? And the question is, do you have a system um, of, I don't know, it could be like a statement of care, it could be a statement of ethics, a lot of different places call them different things, but some way that you decide how people can interact with things. So that's a question I wanna throw out to you all. And I'd really be curious to hear what you think about it. And you can, uh, there's a few of us, few enough of us probably that you could just, oh wait, I see a hand raised. Somebody raised the digital hand, maybe. Yeah, I raised my hand. Uh, this is Aaron Ramirez from the Pueblo City County Library District. Hey, Aaron. Um, hey. Uh, so, as far as like access to uh, to records and stuff in our holdings, we could be generally everything is accessible. Um, and any exception to that would be with like restricted materials that have to do with like, uh, uh, for example, we have. Uh, rock art um, uh, documentation that has uh, the coordinates to their location. So that would be restricted through the Office of Archaeological and Historic uh, and History through the Colorado uh, Agency. Okay. So that's, that's restricted. Um, and uh, I guess it would just be up to the donor agreement what, what it would be. One, one example that's kind of interesting is there's a, a state asylum, a mental hospital here and uh, those people are dead, but then how much access do you give to researchers? Do they have to be a family member to see these like really intimate mm -hmm. uh, personal, personal files of these people that are long gone, but um, has some really mm, like traumatic and uh, personal things in it. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it would be like a case by case basics, basis with the donor, with the, with the communities that you're dealing with. So you make a really good point there um, and something I'm hoping you could say more about and, and that's donor agreements. And, and that, so there's a lot of questions around that, right? Like who is giving you stuff or are you, you know, are you purchasing things, et cetera? How does all that work for you? And, and I think that would be kind of be helpful probably for, for other smaller community collections as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we have a deed of gift form that basically is a transfer of the material that the donor is giving us and so we and with that, that is a transfer of copyright from uh the donor to to the library or to the district um and with that you know it's uh critical that we t explain everything that's happening in that transaction mm. and so like with um uh, with that, like we need that as a sort of like risk mitigation sort of instrument here so that we can go back and say, oh, we're going to spend all these resources on preserving this material. Uh, and, you know, we have permission to provide access to them. So you get those restrictions that the donor would have and all the stuff that we accept. It has to be that person's property or created by or collected by that person. So, um, the one iffy thing that I'm kind of struggling with is that rock art co collection because there's images of, uh, you know, most likely sacred sites um, that were uh, documented by people that are, are not, that don't have any tribal affiliation and stuff like that. So that's yeah. something that I'm looking at. And then, um, yeah, so just as an aside, like going forward, um, you know, we don't want, I want to instill trust in the communities that we're, or approaching or, uh, you know, collaborating with so that we're not just like, let's have all your stuff and we'll decide on how it's used and things like that. So it's, I think it's like critical to have that dialogue yeah. back and forth and transparency. 
So, so that's, that's great. And, and if I can ask you one more follow-up question, it, how, like how, um, how much are things coming to you that you have to decide on versus you're being proactive and saying, we want to, you know, preserve or, or be a part of these other collections? Yeah. So we're pretty fortunate. Uh, we're, uh, a big part of the community here or like we're well known, I guess. And, uh, we have a lot of support. Um, so people will approach us and with, uh, donations that we'll accept mostly, okay. um, if it fits into what we're collecting. But, um, as far as reaching out, there's not a whole lot. So I think that's one thing that's lacking in our program is, is going out into the, you know, we have a incredibly diverse, uh, uh, city and county and region here. Um, in Southern Colorado. And so um, we recently got uh, the Community Webs Grant uh, application uh, through Archive It. And I suggest anybody on the call to look up Community Webs. It's um, uh, Internet Archive runs this program called Archive It. And it's a web, web archiving platform, browser-based. And um, they're looking for new organizations. Uh, in the summer, they'll have another uh, round open, but um, we'll we'll end up getting uh, three years of service to uh, digitally preserve through Internet Archive uh, anything online, uh, social media uh, threads, uh, websites, newsletters, PDFs, all of that stuff. So I'm really uh, looking forward to using that as an outreach tool to to reach out to all of the all the cultural groups around us. So and that's something that I can. I can give, I can offer, and I'm not like, let me have your stuff kind of thing. Yeah. So, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that the let me have your stuff kind of thing is is problematic, right? In yeah. a lot of ways. And and yeah. I think one of the big questions too is if we're talking about, you know, when I talk about decolonization or you know, intersectionality, these kinds of things, I measure it by one thing. What is the what is the transfer of wealth or power? And and I think that's the question is is how much of this can be um, kind of transitioned to a community level where people are keeping those things. I mean, in some places, obviously, they're going to want to collaborate with a, a larger institution because they don't have, um, they may not have storage space, they may not have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a great, that's a really great question. Thanks for sharing a lot, Aaron. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Let me come back to it too. Anyone else have any thoughts around this? What you share, why you share it, um, ways of sharing? Go ahead, Mimi. So we had an interesting question just come up uh, yesterday or today, which has to do with um, material that the community might not like um, restricted access question. Yeah, yeah. And and the question was around land grant um, uh, documents or um, and and the question that arose for me is that on things like that, there might that might be a situation where somebody's already also, there might be multiple copies of these documents and okay. some bigger archive like the state archives or the UNM library or something might have that material, mm -hmm. might already have it digitized and might already be, you know, letting people have access to it. That's so right. what do you do in a situation like that where somebody else, you know, the community might feel that the, that the access should be restricted, but, but it's already out there. <laughs> that's flipping it around. And that's, isn't that the case? And we talk a lot too about digital repatriation or physical repatriation of collections where things have been put out into the public and the open that shouldn't be according to community standards you know, or specific community standards. A lot of that is the case in tribal communities, for instance, and people are trying to get them taken down. And I think that's a really interesting balance to strike. I don't know. The answer seems obvious to me, Mimi. Like you have to go with who has the, like who has the authority over the thing itself. Like right. in, in well, which case, it's not the Smithsonian or the State Library necessarily. It's the person who's right. But they have to. That that's going to take a um, a seating. A, a sort of to your point about power relationships, mm -hmm. they're going to have to agree to co-steward with the community. The right? larger institution. Yeah. yeah. That's right. You know, I mean, if they've got it and they've digitized it and they've created, you know, just access to anybody on it. So I think it's a really interesting, um, it's not repatriation. It's like a whole different attitude about mm. um, ownership. 
Yeah, that's true. I think a lot about, um, you know, I've seen a lot of examples of this in Australia and New Zealand in particular, where it, it is more, probably more around the questions of repatriation, because there's just things that don't, that institutions hold that just don't belong to them. Um, or, and there's things that they hold that, that should be public that haven't been. You know, you think of like the treaties in New Zealand and the statement like, well, we can see this in the United States too, like the National Archives holds all these treaties which have just now been digitized, but they're offered within no context. Um, and they're certainly not offered back to the communities who agreed to these things in the first place, right? So it is a really interesting question of power and privilege. I think there are some standards though, and this might be, this might be where it gets interesting. Like if we can start to identify where these types of intersections are, um, if they're not national standards, are there international standards? We, like we don't really have it here in the United States, but Australia and New Zealand certainly has moral rights. They call it moral rights. Can we start to apply these international standards and practices to a national? Because we just aren't there yet, but they exist in the world. Um, we hear a lot about um, in the Black mask and Indian traditions in New Orleans, which is a very New Orleans specific thing. I won't even try to start to describe it, but there are these amazing um, masks and um, outfits that people wear and make all year. There's a lot of question around copyright that people hold when they come and take photos of them, that they then sell the photos of these people and they have no access to that too. So that's where a question of where moral rights um, really comes into, into question or into practice, which is something that I think we can explore. Um, who, anyone else have something they wanna add to this question? Or thoughts that you have around it, challenges? I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask Aaron or Aaron or Blake um, about something that I think they do, which is interesting and just sort of follow on a much more specific technical question on it. You okay. know, so when we were talking, you know, I think an interesting thing that Pueblo does in regards to digitization, because they have an ACE digitization lab is, um, and Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong or, and speak to this is, you know, a policy of digitizing without insisting on retaining a copy. So you'll digitize to preserve but completely mm -hmm. leave things in the hands of the people who you're preserving stuff. And the practical question I have is about any kind of either follow-up or keeping track of what you did digitize so that if it does come back to you later, you know what it is, or is that anything, or is it really just a, a matter of true trust and going like, we're preserving this and maybe hopefully someday it'll come back. And so if you're willing to speak to that, I'd love to hear some practicalities about that. Sure, uh, Blake, do you want to field this one? Uh, yeah, I'll take this one. So um, you're exactly correct. We don't require people to donate stuff that they have digitized to our archives. So our space is really a DIY space where they come in and they digitize their own material and they retain all the rights to their own material. Uh, Blake, and Blake, sorry, can I just to get a little more context is this something that is um set up for people's use like it's it's just meant for their use not necessarily as a as a collection facility for you correct okay all right this was this was also a grant from the imls that we received uh in 2018 i think okay and we call it the digital memory lab but this is for people to digitize their home movies or photos or whatever okay and we do have questions occasionally, like if pe people do ask us, they say, if I want to donate a copy of this to you, can I do that? And we tell them that we're open to that, but we don't require it. So that way we want to make sure, we, you know, I kind of think of it as more of an archival awareness building tool. So that way, if down the line, if people want to donate their stuff, they can. So there's more, uh, there's more awareness of the options for it rather than give it to us right now. Yeah. Any any idea what your like what percentage ends up being donated or 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 even just kind of qualitatively like what are 
what do people, how do they receive that? Are they like, why would you want a copy of my home movie? You know, what is that um, like? So <laughs> we, we have, I don't think we've had it long enough to really see a lot of donations come in yet. You know, okay. I've, um, I've approached a few people and they've been, a lot of people have been pretty reticent to give up ownership of their stuff. Yeah. So um, I don't, I think that'll be a few years down the road when people begin feeling comfortable with giving us their stuff. But, um, you know, I think that people, the fact that people do want to digitize their stuff is a recognition on their own part that, that their stuff is worth saving. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a, is this? I, um, I think it's also communicating with them um, you know that we would be open to taking it so like they recognize that it's worth saving but i think also communicating that we think that it's worth saving on our part as well that's really interesting i mean you think about that with oral histories too a lot of the work that's done in oral histories so often when you talk to people they're like oh my story is not important i don't have anything you know why do you want to talk to me and then of course when they start telling their stories i mean everyone's got something and, and it really does give a lens onto some part of history or their own stuff, whatever it may be. It's a very similar concept, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else have something to add? I mean, before I, before I move to the next question, I do want to, Nancy, not to put you on the spot, but I know in talking about, um, you know, your libraries and archives there, I'm really curious to hear you know, how we've, you know, we've talked a bit about how people come to find your stuff. How does that happen? Like, how do people know what you have and, and when people come to discover things? Um, are there specific, like, not just, not necessarily copyright, but more like kind of ethical considerations that are presented to people when they come to explore your archives or? Um, um, you know. Yes, definitely. Um, I think our audience mainly um, are uh, people that have had association with Manal School. Yeah. Um, our main focus is the Protestant influence on um, things like uh, early missions and and uh, school, uh, you know, education and and uh, and. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, and health resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do looking, you know, uh, listening to these conversations, it kind of makes me think, you know, we hold um, the role, say, from the uh, first Indian school that was uh, built here in Albuquerque. Um, we have um, educational records from uh, schools that have closed uh, down. Uh, where, you know, they may have been routed into Manal school, mm. you know, and often we have uh, family members say that will come in and say, can you see if you have records for so-and-so, uh, -so, uh, you know, and, and we'll pull them out and attach as a little report card. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, like eth ethical things that, you know, we have to really be careful of and not uh, even though the people are probably deceased, yeah, uh, you know, and it is a family member, you still have that um, ethical question, you know, do I really want to be showing them these kind of personal, this kind of personal information, so. And, and um, how, do you, how do you make those decisions? Well, uh, I would say if they know that we have it, then we'll usually release it. Mm. And if we, and we realize that these people, you know, are from the late 1800s and so mm. um, early 1900s. And so they, they probably don't really, I mean, there's no, there's no one to check with, you know, really. And if they're a family member, it's usually, you know, we go ahead and give that information out. We are the archive for the school though. And right. so we do hold things like um, the minutes from trustee meetings and really only the upper 
administration from the school has access to that information. So, uh, you know, even though, um, you know, it's, it's in with our other archive materials, um, we, don't, we don't let our researchers back into that area. And so, you know, we're pretty, um, you know, careful with that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah, but, you know, we do have bits and pieces that I could see it would be an ethical question question yeah. whether or not we should let them see that or not. Yeah. Well, that's especially interesting to think of, of community collections that are in the works and a few of you here who are, are, are just getting started and, and how, you know, how much of that could you build into what you're doing um, as part of it as a consideration, um, really something to think about. Mm -hmm. Very well, much so. You know, um, another thing too, I think our history is a little different than how we were founded and, and you know, what our mission was. And it really kind of was a, a, an accident that Manal Historical Library of the Southwest was even created. You know, these documents were found in a vault in the basement of the main administration uh, building. And, you know, somebody just had the forethought just to say, you know, these are important materials, we've got to keep them. And so a lot of these rules, you know, have been instituted, you know, as we go along from, from when it was first created. But, you know, it's just, um, you know, we have so many different things that are education related, you know, are related to the school that we have to, um, you know, make those rules, so. Absolutely. Well, before, kind of turning from finding aids, I'd like to ask another question and that's around the, the metadata description question. And I'm wondering, you know, what experience people have had in terms of where they get stuck describing things, you know, are there, or even like, what are the systems in which you're asked to describe things or that you use to describe things? Obviously there's a lot of different software options. Um, some will use, you know, some will use mark descriptions, some will use, in fact, somebody in part of this research, I just looked at like a graph of, there must be like literally 200 different forms, like standards of description for all the different things there might be. Um, but has anyone experienced this in, in, your, in your collecting at, to this point, like where you come to a point where you have a hard time describing something or what you're just like it doesn't fit the choices that you have. Does anyone have any experience around that, I wonder? You know, um, we've had that experience in that um, we have started using past perfect cataloging information and they have a whole um, section that you can go to, um, you know, where you, you break down your descriptions you know, in four different categories. And, okay. and for the most part, we try and stick to that now. But when we were first started, everything was um, very primitive. And, and of course, everything was handwritten for the most part. We used a card catalog. Wow. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, one thing that, that happened to me, you know, when I, we started digitizing our VHS recordings is that sometimes somebody would describe the original uh, information as um, say film strip okay. when really it was a, a film um, or maybe it was um, you know a, a, a diskette or you know whatever and as the technology changed those records remained in you know in the past <laughs> and uh -huh. so now that we're trying to find things now, you know, of course, a lot of those descriptions have changed. Right. And so, yeah, so it's, it's that it to us has been very difficult. And of course their finding tools then were a lot different than what we're using now. So we're kind of going through that transition period where we're trying to get it all in the same uh, category. So, or the correct right. category, so. Yeah, that's interesting. And for the most part, those changes have been incremental, right? Like, yeah, from, very from much so. 
1820s to the 1840s, they started to have different technology or whatever it is. And, and so we end up with this, you know, massive structure that seems daunting to change. And, and that's really the big question that we have is how do you approach such an embedded system um, or such an entrenched system? But that's where we're starting to be, you know, we're seeing inspiration from these completely alternative methods. But now the bigger systems are trying to figure out how to adapt to that and what that looks like. It helps that there's a legal, kind of a legal push for that in Canada, Australia, New Zealand as well, um, which we don't have here. There's no legal impetus for it, um, but it's a really interesting question. Yeah, uh, very much so. Does anyone else have thoughts on, on any of that, Mimi? I have a question for you and, and whoever else. What about issues around people's uh, self-representation? Like where they're using different terminology that might be either like, so we would have maybe Hanisado, Indo-Hispano, and then mm. you have other people that self-identify as Mexican-American, Chicano, Hispano, Hispana, you know, so are you saying that what's developing now is going to be a way for people to find you, um, to find people who are have similar backgrounds but different ways of self-representing? I think that's the that's the idea. I mean, that's the biggest question. Is is it is about self-representation and self-determination, right? And for for who the collection is about, or for how you want to define things. Really, the other question though is. How does, how does somebody else find that 20 years from now or 30 years from now? What is promising to me, and I think this is where the technology really overlaps with linked open data, is you have this ability to use multiple, you know, we have the technology now to use multiple words to describe the same thing. And we see it just from language translations. Or you think about like Wikipedia, something like of a scale like that, where it is, it becomes easy to find things because things are linked together or mapped together in ways that you couldn't do with a card catalog or you couldn't even approach it from that way. I think the other question, and I've got one of these many papers sitting on my desk. I don't know, I, I don't, this is, these are like, I mean, I don't know if anyone else, like I literally I have tons of these reports on my on my desk, which I don't think I'm ever gonna read, but I just make, think it makes me feel, I don't know, ambitiously smarter to think that I will read them or something, but I at least read the abstracts. And this is a great one that I'm looking at. It just came out called A Weapon and a Tool, Decolonizing Description and Embracing Redescription as Liberatory Archival Praxis. So it's really taking kind of social justice methodology and applying it to the limitations of archival theory um, and descriptive theory in particular. Um, and it goes really deep into examples of this, um, you know, such as uh, sovereignty, particularly in indigenous communities and archival redescription. So I, it's a huge question. And it's, and, and really, I think what's interesting to me, again, with to, to tie it back to the Manitos project, is that these questions are being faced constantly on the community level. And at some point it's just sort of been, there's kind of been this workaround or hack for convenience that's been created and, and a lens that's been applied that we're not able to, we're not able to easily change. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts or experience with that though. So John, so a question I have, which is related to Mimi's question, I think, um, and, and maybe, uh, and if others that have thoughts on this as well as, you know, a lot of it to me does come down to this question now is how does these new ways of these, th these opportunities that are now open for people to self define and self, you know, uh, that empowerment thing, how does that intersect with the traditions of conventional, you know, institutional archival practice you know, and maybe this is like a bigger conversation for another time. Yeah. We revisit a few months later. But do you have any thoughts on that? Just like, what does that look like a little bit, that intersection? Since they're so different. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you're coming at something from two totally different perspectives. And it's not, it, it to me, what we're struggling with, looking at it within the context, too, of a convening of how do we bring people together who have such different approaches, even. Um, 
it's like, where do you even find common ground? And I do think that it's, they're completely different knowledge management systems. Like the knowledge management system, which we're sort of stuck with out of the box, if you will. And, you know, Shane, we've talked a ton about this in terms of the technology that we're, we're using. It comes with these certain limitations, unless it's been designed for another case, you know? So this is like where you weigh against a, a Mukuru platform versus a Omeka platform. You know, they're, they're coming from really different directions. They do different things, but are they using the same library organization principles? I don't know, you know, like that may be a question for people who are studying that profession, but I do think it does come down to that level. Like what, how are we teaching this in library information schools? What are the foundation? I mean, well, you could keep going on that all day long, you know, like how are we teaching history and how are we teaching all these other, uh, you know, how are universities structured, et cetera. They were built a certain way to do a certain thing. And that's not exactly what we're trying to use them for right now. So I, I yeah, no easy answer on that um, for sure. And, and all I can say is I keep thinking of how do, we, how do we find the common ground even to approach this, where you've got a lot of people from different angles with different intentions too. Um, trying to do different things. And I think of one of our tribal library partners, you know, I'll never forget when, when she was describing this amazing collection of oral history videos and things they had created. And um, I was just blown away by the concept and she, as she described it. And I was just like, wow, that sounds amazing. How can I, how can I find it? Where have you posted it on the web? And she was just like, you can't find it on the web. You come to my library, and if I decide to tell you about it, that's how you'll know it's there. Like that, and, and it was just the, because the purpose of it wasn't for me. It wasn't for researchers. It was for that community. And I think the same is to be said for how we're organizing these histories or how why we're even collecting these histories. Who is it for? How do we intend for it to be found? And therefore, how do we describe it? And how do we make use of it? So maybe that's a good point to land us on. Um, here as we're a minute to six. Uh, although I welcome any other any other questions or thoughts to close. Yeah, I, I think you're right. If if no one has anything else to say, that'll be its own accomplishment that we managed to end on time. I know that rarely happens. Oh wait, Ellen's going to say something. Ellen, you have a chat thing. <laughs> she's just saying thank. You. Oh, she's saying thank you. Great. So so yeah so. Um, that, I think you're right. That's a great place to end it. So thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for, for sharing and talking about things. So um, yeah, thank yeah. you. And, and also, I will say, Shane, I'm hoping that we can come back around in a couple months time to do maybe some more workshop things around this as, as people develop their collections. Um, or as we look at uh, more of the details of what finding aids might be or different ways we can do description. So this was hopefully just enough to, to get you interested and we, and we could come back around to that later. I love that idea. So yes, definitely we'll start working on that so we can circle back because uh, yeah, this is a dialogue and we can start to work on useful stuff and do that, that would be awesome. So I love that idea, so cool. Great, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Ellen, for, for helping with this, too. Good to see you. So cool. So we'll see you all next month, I hope. Uh, you'll hear from us about the next event. And uh, next time, John's going to be back for those workshops. So goodbye for now. <laughs>